on the mic. I am. Good. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, good evening and welcome to our third Imagine event. And uh, tonight we'll hear from the extremely eminent uh, Sir Michael Palmer. Uh, I'm Alistair Bruard and I'm with the Cambridge Commons and we're a group uh, operating Cambridge on uh, local inequality. We're bringing these to you in collaboration with uh, Angle Ruskin's Labour History Group. Uh, Cambridge Commons, as I said, mainly works locally and uh, we do all kinds of things, including uh, quite a detailed report on uh, health inequalities in Cambridge. So if that's of interest to you, please uh, contact some, ask somebody who's got a badge about it and we'll get a copy to you. Uh, now, Imagine tonight is uh, big picture stuff. Uh, it's mainly about two things. Uh, the first is ideas. It's uh, 40 years now that neoliberal ideals of uh, you know, getting ahead and markets always right uh, have held utter sway. And um, you know, they're not nonsense, but uh, they've, they've gone too far and they've divided us too much and, uh, and they've ramped inequality and inequality rots society. So, uh, you know, finally there's a bit of a wind of change in the air, uh, which is good, but we do need to know where we're trying to get. So that's the first thing. The second thing is really joining the dots between um, you know, inequality infests everything, uh, education, health, tax, justice, housing, health, you name it. Uh, and they all feed each other. Uh, so we do need holistic solutions, but um, it also helps to look at each element in some detail, which is why we've asked so many eminent people to come and use their expertise as a prism through which to present some positive thoughts about how we can make this country a fairer, better place in uh, 10 years' time. Uh, so uh, tonight, uh, we'll, we'll do health. Next week, as it happens, we've got the very highly regarded Professor Helen Margits, who's director of the Oxford Internet Institute, going to come and scare the bejesus out of us about uh, social media, big data, who's controlling who, and um, you know, and this is a huge piece of the inequality jigsaw, and it's largely kind of on the iceberg, a submerged bit that we don't notice, so it's a really relevant talk. And then we've got about 10 more covering, you know, racism, tax, yada, 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 yada. Um, so I hope I've kind of sold you on why you shouldn't just come to your favorite gig, please, Come to all of them because that's how you see the, the big picture and we build good solutions. Uh, as for tonight, um, you know, enjoy it. Uh, but believe it or not, we're a, a shoestring organisation funded, uh, staffed and funded, you know, only by volunteers' work. And so, you know, your your main mission here is to enjoy. We hope you'll join in. But if you you know, want to help us, you can help us by giving us some feedback. We've distributed forms, we really value it. Um, you can put cash in the bucket, we, we <laughs> really appreciate that. Um, you, you, we love new volunteers. And uh, finally, we've got uh, a very slight surplus of flyers, and if you did nothing else but take a handful of those and bomb your workplace or your neighbourhood, um, that would be much appreciated because they'll be out of date in about two weeks' time. And then we'll do some more for the later talks that may cover this, this time. So, are you talking to me? No, no, I was saying I must just do a little bit. Good, thank you. Um, so, some, some bits of uh, admin. Uh, there's a bookstore outside, you saw it. Michael will sign copies of his book if you ask me to come afterwards. Uh, but you'll see the range of books, those are from our other speakers to illustrate the breadth of this uh, project. Uh, Wi-Fi code and um, put the hashtag up here, please use them. Uh, if we have a fire, we're, uh, the, the fire alarm, if it's real, and there's an exit over there, and there's an exit there, and we assemble on the road outside. 
Uh, finally, we're recording these, um, so just to remind if that's a problem to anyone, see somebody wearing a badge before you leave tonight. And it's also why we will try to get you on mics if the bloody things can be made to work. Okay, but it, it just picks you up better for the q &A. So my last uh, thing is just to introduce David Howarth, who um, has been 20 years in government at the local level and then as MP for Cambridge and uh, for a number of years now has been a Professor of Law and Public Policy at Cambridge University. And David's going to introduce uh, Sir Michael and chair the discussion. Thank you, David. But uh, he mentioned about the money. Um, so we're absolutely delighted to uh, have as our third speaker in the series, uh, Michael Marmot, who is um, Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health at UCL, and Director of the International Institute for Society and Health, and of the Institute for Health, health Equity. Um, he's, as I said, a, a recipient of enormous numbers of awards, honours, both professional and academic. So I'll just mention two. He was president of the BMA in 2010 to 11, and president of the world uh, equivalent, the, the World Medical Association, in 2015 16. Um, he's worked for many years on uh, problems of health and inequality. And I suppose he's best known for his work on the social determinants of health, culminating in his uh, report for the UK government in 2010. Uh, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, which actually is better known as the Marmot Review. Um, he's known for also for a number of striking research results. So I'll just mention one, which is the one for which he's known well outside his own field. And that is the finding that ill health is related not just to absolute levels of poverty and lack of resources, but it's also related to relative uh, disadvantage to being low down in the status hierarchy, for example. And that's why, if you want a more healthy society, you have to look first to equality uh, above all else. So we're absolutely delighted that uh, Michael Marmot is here to talk to us tonight. And I now invite him to speak. He, he'll speak for about 40 minutes, uh, and then we'll have questions. We think you to talk. So I hope Michael has questions later. Michael. Well, thank you, and it is a great pleasure to be here. I was asked to talk about positive things. Well, uh, I'm going to talk about some negative things, but the positive side is the solutions are really easy. So although I'm going to talk about some of the bad things that are happening, we understand enough to make a huge difference. So that's my positive message. And I'll try and be a bit more positive at the end. Whoops. How do I go back? You heard that I spent a year at the BMA, a year at the World Medical Association. And what I said to the doctors, and I'll come back to the doctors at the end, was why treat people and send them back to the conditions that make them sick? And that's the first line of my book, The Health Gap, which means that we should be paying attention to the conditions that make people sick. Um, the Italian version, La Salute. Disagree, you know. There's no way, there's no way an English version would have me on the cover. <laughs> in fact, um, the Trento Festival of Economics in northern Italy, the theme this year of the Festival of Economics was Salute Disuguale, and there was a life-size cardboard cutout of me. So of course, I had a photo taken of me next to it, and. SMS'd it to my kids, uh, one of whom came back said, the other one looks better than you do. <laughs> and one of them said, lovely shoes you're wearing, Dad. Um, okay. 
we published in the summer some data from Britain, as you heard, I did the Marmot Review 2010, and one of the features of what we've been doing since is monitoring health inequalities and social determinants of health every year, a year and a half. We've done a lot on early childhood, and I'll say a bit on early childhood later. But this year we featured this. Life expectancy had been increasing 2006 to 2010. For men, the rate was about 0.3 of a year every year. And for women, it was 0.24 of a year every year. And in 2010, something changed. From 2011 to 2015, the rate of increase for men was 0.07, it was more or less flat per year, and for women, 0.02, more or less flat. And the press got all excited about this. Um, I spent a day talking to the BBC and got to know what. In the afternoon, Jeremy Hunt, the Secretary of State for Health, tweeted, Respect, Mahmoud. I didn't know whether there should have been a <laughs> Respect, Mahmoud. <laughs> but since he was on the BBC this morning, life expectancy for men has increased by 61 minutes. <laughs> so I tweeted back, what are you saying? Question mark. <laughs> that the Office for National Statistics got its figures wrong and the rise of life expectancy has not slowed down? Question mark. If ONS is correct, let's discuss. Uh, one of my colleagues tweeted, Ooh, Jeremy Hunt's <laughs> picked a statistical fight with Michael Marmer. <laughs> <laughs> my money's on Marmer. <laughs> I'm going to show you some data from the US because my concern is that this may be a harbinger of worse to come. And the worse to come is happening. Anne Case and Angus Steeton recently updated these figures. This is from a 2015 paper. <coughs> Looking at all cause mortality at ages 45 to 54. From 1990 to 2012, they just updated it to 2015, but it shows the same thing. You can see France, they told me there's a high-tech pointer, but this is fairly high-tech. France, <laughs> Germany, UK, Canada, Australia, Sweden. In all those countries, the mortality is coming down. Big differences between France and Sweden, but it's coming down as it is for U.S. Hispanics. Now look at U.S. non-Hispanic whites going up. And the causes, number one, poisonings due to drugs and alcohol. Suicide, chronic liver disease, which is largely alcohol. And then of course, the toll of violent deaths. And if you look at, this is from their update, 2017, if you look at the rise in mortality by education, so high school or less, this is women, but it's similar for men, high school or less, big rise, some college, a rise, BA or more a fall. So the inequalities are getting bigger. The social gradient, as David introduced, is getting steeper. And this has profound implications, of course, for people's health. I mean, we're used to the fact in rich countries things get better all the time. We just expect that we're going to be healthier next year than we were this year. And it's not true in the US. 
US non-Hispanic whites are getting sicker. And when all else seems lost, this is Trump vote over performance compared with Romney in 2012 by quartiles of mortality during, due to drugs, alcohol, and suicide. So the higher the mortality from drugs, alcohol, and suicide, this by geographical area, the more likely were people to vote for Trump. I don't think Trump caused suicide <laughs> or drug-related deaths, but in one sense, drug-related deaths did cause Trump. He's a symptom of what's going wrong. Because it's the, and you know, they, the ones who didn't kill themselves voted for Trump, who may kill the rest of us um, in Korea. Because if you now look at economic distress, those same areas, quartiles of economic distress, are the areas <coughs> with the high mortality from drugs, alcohol, and suicide, and they're the areas that voted Trump. Are you now seeing the parallels with Brexit? And when we, but before I get to that, um, if you're feeling poorly, vote for a snake oil salesman. Um, so again, geographical area, better health, worse health. The worse the health, the more likely people were to vote for Trump. <coughs> so ill health was one of the best predictors of Trump voting. But I don't think it's just, I feel ghastly <laughs> for Trump. So everybody else can feel wrong too. Um, I think what I said, it's the causes of dissatisfaction that lead to ill health and lead to voting for a snake oil salesman. Can you, you're getting a picture of my feeling for this outcome of the democratic process. But I'm feeling good today because if you look at the, re we shouldn't make too much of it, but if you look at the results from the elections in the US on Tuesday, the Tuesday result, are the nicest two that I liked. One was that, in, I think it was in Virginia, yes. one yeah. congressman said he introduced a bill about bathrooms for transsexuals or whatever it was. And, because, and so he was challenged by a transsexual woman and beat him. <laughs> and another congressman, when the Women's March after the inauguration, he tweeted, I hope they get home in time to cook dinner. And a young woman was so enraged by this that she was determined to defeat him electorally, and she did. <laughs> and she won. So I'm feeling pleased about all that. <laughs> now, there's, you know, we shouldn't put too much by it. But I am concerned at what it means for the UK. <clears throat> this was a paper uh, published quite recently from Manchester looking at mortality north and south. This particular graph is for um, young men 25 to 34. And what you can see is that there was no north-south difference in the 1980s. And in fact, there was a rise. And what did that rise consist of? Suicide, alcohol, and not so much drugs, but suicide and alcohol. I mean, I remember at the time, I was on the Chief Medical Officer's Committee on Health of the Nation. And we were concerned about this rise in suicide. And they'd say, what could it be due to? And I said, unemployment. And the chair of the committee said, there's no link between unemployment and suicide. Okay. Next item. And we moved on. And afterwards, I went up to him and said, what do you mean there's no link between unemployment and suicide? He said, well, it's not a one-to-one -one link. <laughs> <laughs> I said, it, it were, it would solve the unemployment problem. <laughs> 
And so I think what we're seeing in this graph is the scorched earth industrial policy of the 1980s playing out in mortality. <coughs> you can actually see it. And then in the mid 90s, mortality came down nicely in the south, but failed to come down for at least another decade in the north. And arguably, this was the economic recovery in the south of high tech industry and the financial sector, which didn't happen in the north. Now it is coming down, but there's still a huge gap. And of course, that's where the Brexit vote was. It wasn't in the opulent southeast, it wasn't in Cambridge, it wasn't in London, um, it was in the de industrialized north. The same kind of areas that voted for Trump and where people killed themselves with drugs and alcohol and other forms of suicide. To emphasize the point that David made, and this is figure one in my Marmot review and in my book, The Health Gap, that health follows the gradient. Each dot here represents a neighborhood classified by degree of deprivation. So you've got the least deprived, most affluent there, the most deprived there. And the top graph is life expectancy. And what you can see is people near the top have shorter life expectancy than those at the top. Those in the middle, shorter than those near the top, all the way from top to bottom. The dotted line is 1999 to 2003, the solid line is 10 years later, you can see that life expectancy has increased, but the gradient didn't seem to change much. Although, I've got some good news a bit later. And what this means, looking at disability-free life expectancy, the gradient is steeper, and People at the top are living about 12 years of their lives with disability. And people at the bottom are living about 20 years of their lives with disability. Regularly, I'm told that no government will take me seriously unless I can make the economic case. I say, OK, that's easy. I've got a good, cheap, cost-effective intervention. <coughs> hand out free cigarettes to the poor. Cheap, but it work. You don't look very excited. <laughs> <laughs> of course you're not excited by that idea. It's morally corrupt. We don't do what's cheap and cost effective if it's morally wrong. You only have to think about that grisly thought experiment for one moment to know it's wrong. And the whole idea that governments would only listen if you make the economic case. What about the moral case? So I'm very happy if people want to make the economic case, power to them. But I'm going to make the moral case. So having said there's a gradient, nevertheless, people have to be at the bottom. When I published the, before I did the English review, I chaired the World Health Organization Commission on Social Determinants of Health. And I was trying to make common cause between the inequalities in health between countries and the inequalities within countries. I referred to a more than 40 year gap in life expectancy between countries, but within Glasgow, between Calton and Lindsay in Glasgow, there was a 28-year gap in male life expectancy. Life expectancy for men in Calton was 54, and in Lindsay, 82. I was at a meeting in Brussels, and a man came up to me and said, I'm from Lindsay, and I drink in the pub with a friend from Calton. And I thought, 
Yeah, it doesn't surprise me they wouldn't let people from Calton come to a meeting in Brussels. <laughs> and he said, I was in the pub with my friend the other night, and it turned out he'd made no arrangements for a pension. And this chap said, I asked my friend, why not? He said, because I'm 54. <laughs> oh dear. I said, I'm pleased that my research is being discussed in Scottish pubs, and I hope elsewhere. But the idea that that's destiny is really frightening. Well, what's it like growing up in Carlton? Jimmy had a single mother with a succession of male partners, each of whom abused Jimmy physically, if not sexually. He had behavior problems by the time he got to school. As soon as he was old enough, he was labeled a delinquent. He was known to the police. He was involved in gangs and violence. When he left school, he never had a proper job. Any money he gets goes on drink and drugs. His diet, if you could call it that, is pub food, fast food, and alcohol. By the way, if you think that poor people are sick because they make poor choices, and what you really need to do is tell them to eat properly, then I invite you to go to Glasgow and talk to Jimmy and tell him to pull his socks up, um, start having a sensible diet, get a job, behave. I wish I could do a Glaswegian accent. And, but you can guess the second word Jimmy would use would be off. <laughs> and, And Jimmy's life expectancy is eight years less than the Indian average. So what are we going to do? And in my English review, we talked about the life force. And I'm going to talk about some problems that we have to address. And I say it's going to sound a bit negative, but it's so easy conceptually to address these problems that that's the positive to take away. So I had six domains of recommendations. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, fair employment and good work for all, healthy standard of living for all, healthy and sustainable places, and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. So let's have a look at some of them. Oops. I'm not doing this very well. So, Give every child the best start in life. We've been monitoring early child development. And the figures show something like this. Well, they don't show something like this. They show this. Um, this is the percent of children, age five, who have a good level of development. Cognitive, linguistic, social, emotional, behavioral development. 13 indicators. In each local authority, ranked on an index of multiple deprivation. So the most affluent here, the most deprived there. And you can see a straight line relation. And that suggests one strategy to reduce inequalities in early childhood would be to reduce deprivation. <coughs> By the way, early childhood is important because it sets what happens for the rest of life. Good early child development determines what happens in school, and what happens in school determines what happens to you after school. Do you go on to university? Do you have a good job, which is interesting, enough money to live, nice place to live, and so on, and that relates to health and health inequalities. So it goes through the life course. Early childhood is very important. One strategy, reduce poverty and deprivation, move these people up towards the middle. 
I showed a version of this graph in the Parliament, and one person in the audience said, the multiple R squared on that correlation be quite low. I thought that's what members of Parliament most want to hear about. R squared, yeah. The proportion of variance explained. Um, I was uh, talking to an economist, and I talked about correlation. He said, are you an economist? I said, do you imagine that economists are the only people in the world who do statistics? <laughs> yeah, he did. He thought anybody who talked the language of correlation had to be an economist. Well, so what I explained to members of parliament is that this joker who was talking about multiple R squared, what he's trying to say is there's variation around the line. For a given level of deprivation, some local authorities are doing better than others. They have a higher proportion of children age five with a good level of development. So a second strategy, in addition to reducing deprivation, is to figure out what the good ones are doing, how to break the link between deprivation and poor early child development. I went off to East London. Hackney which still, I mean, my kids can't afford to live in Hackney because it's rapidly gentrifying, but there's still a lot of deprivation. So look first at England. 60% of kids have a good level of development age five, which ain't great, by the way. We rank fairly low in international rankings. And if you look at children eligible for free school meals, one definition of poverty, then under 45% have a good level of development. The gap is nearly 16%. Now look at Hackney. The poor kids, the kids from poor families, eligible for free school meals, are doing as well as the English average. The director of education in Hackney said to me, we tell ourselves every day, poverty is not destiny. Now look at Bath and North East Somerset. I went to Swansea a few weeks ago, and as the train stopped in Bath Spa, beautiful green hills, gorgeous, gorgeous, I called out, what do you do for poor kids in Bath? <laughs> and I'm not hearing voices, but I imagined a voice calling back to say, poor kids? We didn't know we had any. And I think that's the issue. They've got a lot of poor kids in Hackney. If they don't focus on the poor kids, what are they doing getting out of bed in the morning? And if you focus on it, you can make a difference. Close the gap. There is a well-known London effect <coughs> in education. The gap, it looks the same for GCSEs as well. The gap between kids eligible for free school <coughs> meals and the average at GCSE level is much smaller in London than the rest of the country. There was a proposal to equalise the funding for education, i.e. take money away from London. No! Do in the rest of the country what London's doing. Don't take money away from London. Give more to other parts and focus on the problem. <coughs> I said the second strategy is to reduce poverty. This is child poverty, where in each country, child poverty is defined as less than 60% median income. So it's child poverty before and after taxes and transfers. Latvia, child poverty was 35%. Sweden, 32%. After taxes and transfers. Child poverty in Latvia was 25%. In Sweden, it was 12%. They don't like child poverty in Sweden, so they use the tax and transfer system to reduce it. I was in the US over the weekend, and the figures in the US after taxes and transfers, look worse than Latvia. I wanted to, I was doing a piece for Scientific American and 
the editor on child development, the editor said, I talked about taxes and benefits, and he said, I think you ought to take that out, because I think you're talking about redistribution. <laughs> and there's no appetite for that. Well, actually, there is an appetite if you're watching the tax bill go through Congress at the moment. They're all in favor of redistribution. Upwards. <laughs> so the example I used was comparing the US with Australia. I thought if I compared it with Sweden, Sweden sounds like a Marxist Leninist. But Australia, you know, Australia sounds like Texas or <laughs> California. And before taxes and transfers, I had a different de definition of poverty. It was less than 50%. Before taxes and transfers, child poverty in the US was around 24%. And in Australia, it was 29%. After taxes and transfers, child poverty in the US, less than 50, went from 24 to 23%. And in Australia, went from 29% to 11%. And the editor of Scientific America said, what are taxes and transfers? <laughs> he said, well, they're taxes and benefits paid. He said, I don't think I understand this. Are you saying that in Australia, they take money from rich people, middle income people, and they give it to poor people in money or benefits? I said, yeah. Really? Some countries actually do that? I said, now you're getting a handle on some of your problems. So, two strategies. <coughs> Education. These are PISA scores, the Programme of International Student Assessment, that looks at maths, science, and literacy for youngsters age 50 in different countries. Finland always does the best in Europe. And what we see here is the gradient by economic and social classification that the OECD uses. And so you can see a gradient, the higher the social background, social and economic background, the better the performance. Here's the UK. Our top quartile is slightly worse than the top quartile in Finland, but our bottom quartile is much worse. The gradient is steeper. And there's the US, much steeper. So you're starting to get a picture the US doesn't do well on early child development and child poverty, not doing well in education, and a steep gradient. I spend a lot of time on it, but we know that for the bottom half, if not 80% of the population, mean incomes in the US have not risen in 30 years. And people are killing themselves or voting for Trump. And we need to be really careful that that's not the future that we're painting for ourselves in this country. So, fair employment and good work for all. One of the things we're seeing is that the causes of occupational related ill health are changing. Over time, the proportion of occupational ill health conditions due to musculoskeletal disorders is declining, but stress-related is rising. The quality of work really matters. Unemployment's very bad, but the quality of work really matters. But one of the things we want work to do is to get people out of poverty. This is people below the so-called minimum income threshold from Joseph Browntree Foundation. And it looks at people below the poverty line by whether someone in the household is working or not. So these paler colors are households where at least one adult is working. 
a majority of people below the minimum income threshold have at least one adult working. These people are in poverty not because they're feckless, not because they're lazy, not because they can't be bothered. They're in poverty because they're lowly paid. That's why they're in poverty. We could solve that one tomorrow. Have you been reading the Paradise of Papers? Have you been looking? The, today's figure from the US was to get into the Fortune 400 top richest people in the US, you now have to have two billion dollars. The top three, the richest three, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and Jeff Bezos, between them, I think, have as much wealth as the bottom 60%, as 160 million Americans. This is really bizarre. And the figures are simply astounding for how much tax we're losing in this country because of tax havens offshore. Never mind 350 million pounds a week for the NHS. You know, we can get that by getting rid of the tax havens. So we're doing things. I, I know you told me you wanted good news. <laughs> but it's simple, isn't it? We could do it easily. <coughs> and that relates to a healthy standard of living for all. Some government ministers have been boasting that inequality has come down, and it's true. This is um, the change in real household income by percentile, percentile points of income. 2007-8 to 2020-21, but if we look first to 2015-16, yeah, the top income earners did get a decline. The global financial crisis, 2007-8, really had an impact on top earners. And benefit levels, initially, were high. So it preserved the income of people at the bottom. Inequality really did come down uh, after the financial crisis. But now, look at what's going to happen from 2015-16 to 2020-21. Well, we're going to sort that one out. Um, the rich people are going to catch up, in fact, the, apart from the very bottom, the lower your income, the less increase you're going to get. The richer you are, the richer you're going to get. The inequality is going to increase dramatically. That's what's set to happen. And of course, the age thing was quite dramatic. If you look at people 60 plus, mostly beyond working age, then median income was preserved. We heard a lot about the triple lock in pensions. It's a complete coincidence that older people tend to vote more than younger people and tend to vote conservative. Total coincidence that the incomes of the older people were preserved. And of younger people plummeted age 22 to 30, look at that. And by 2013-14, we're way below the 2007 level, projected to get back to maybe 5% below the, the pre-crash level. Um, and for the 31 to 59 year olds. So it's not been very good if having enough money to live is a social determinant of health. We've not been addressing that very well. And if you look at the projected changes, the long-run impact of tax and benefit reforms introduced between May 2015 and April 2019, the long-run impact of those reforms, and we're looking to see if the Chancellor is going to do anything about them. We don't think he will then look at 
families of working age with children, 12% reduction, I mean, at the bottom decile, nearly 10% reduction, 12% reduction, and then the greater your income, the less severe the impact. So steeply regressive social and economic policy. So that's not good news. You wanted me to be positive. But the more we talk about it, the greater the likelihood there is of doing something different. It does not have to be this way. There is no economic necessity for it to be this way. <clears throat> Healthy and sustainable places and communities. Local authority cuts 2009-10 to 2014-15. 23% cuts in the spending power of local authorities after accounting for inflation of population growth. Spending per capita on social care cut by 17% in real terms. Central government grants cut by 39% per person in real terms. And on average, cuts were greatest in areas with a high level of spending need relative to revenue raising capacity. And Margaret Whitehead, in her report from Liverpool due north, showed that the higher the mortality rate of a local area, the steeper the cut. And of course, the more deprived the area, the higher the mortality. So more deprived areas and areas in greater need were having more severe cuts. That's not good news. But the more we talk about it, the more possibility there is for change. And housing tenure. For people aged under 35, owner occupation was just under 60% in 1997, and it's now 25%. Private renters, <laughs> For the young people for under 35, much higher than social housing tenants. And we know that the quality of housing in the private rental sector is worse than in the private rental sector. This is dramatic. Bit of good news. The King's Fund did a survey after my 2010 review of health and well-being boards in local government and asked them what their priority was. Number one, out of 65, 49 said Marmot principles. One local councillor in Manchester, when I met her, said, you're Marmot. I thought, I didn't realise Marmot was a person. <laughs> we talk about implementing Marmot. <laughs> and strengthen the role and impact of ill health prevention. This is childhood obesity, age 10 to 11. Least deprived area, most deprived area, a gradient. And 2006 to 2012-13, you can see in the least deprived areas, it stopped increasing. In the more affluent, children from more affluent families, it stopped rising. But the more deprived, the steeper the rise. So the inequalities in childhood obesity are growing. And childhood obesity tends to track into adult life. So the inequalities in obesity are set to grow. I said somewhat melodramatically, if we want to solve the obesity problem, we have to solve the inequality problem. Mean number of fast food outlets per thousand people, least deprived by deprivation, and McDonald's, Burger King, KFC, and Pizza Hut. Actually, puts me off my dinner. Look at the author of the paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And you can see the more deprived the area, the higher the density of fast food outlets. In Cambridge, the, uh, they produced um, some mapping. Um, so they mapped fast food outlets in all over the country. Surprise, surprise, talk about nudge. If you put a fast food outlet near a school, the kids are more likely to eat that food. And so it's terrific what the Cambridge people have done with that. And in England, only 18% of people have one or more <coughs> meals a day at the table. Nearly two thirds of people eat at their table less than once a week. What, what does that mean for the quality of food? What does that mean for the quality of family life? Talking to children, talking to your partner, relaxing. I have an Italian colleague who says even when he eats by himself, he has antipasto, pasta, <laughs> main course, and dessert. I mean, the antipasto might be three olives, you know, and a pasta, a piece of fish or something, and an apple. But he goes through the ritual. Even when he's eating by himself, he goes through that ritual. Yeah, that's how to live. So it has impact both for the quality of family life and um, for nutrition. Can strategies to reduce health inequalities work? <coughs> Labour did have a strategy. Any evidence that it worked? Yes. Suicide yes. rate. People in Liverpool, the names dropped off the paper, but people in Liverpool looked at the poorest 20% of local authorities compared with the average. And this was the annual difference, the growth of the life expectancy gap in months, 1983 to 2003. So it was growing for men and for women. The gap was getting bigger. They looked they allowed new labor a bit of time to get their feet under the desk, to have the Atchison report, to plan a strategy and to implement it. And so they said 2004 to 2012, the life expectancy gap got smaller. Number of months, each year, the life expectancy gap diminished between the poorest 20% and the average. After the strategy, different government, the life expectancy gap increased. I think your party was in coalition with the government. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know who was. <laughs> it was his party. Uh, he wasn't there. Thank you. Um, Coventry declared itself a marble city. <laughs> they've taken, I don't know if you know this, but the logo of Coventry is Lady Godiva. And when they said it's a marble city, I thought, oh no. <laughs> I've got to take my kid off and go through on a bicycle. Um, anyway, they are implementing my recommendations across the board. This is not my son. It's the Minister of Health of Sweden. Um, I'm told there are 10 Marmot reviews going on in Sweden. In Malmö, in Gothenburg, in Östersund, in Linköp, in Nordkirk, all around Sweden. They've taken my review and now there's a national review that's just been published. So it's happening. People are taking it on board and saying, how can we implement this? And I said that I tried to get the doctors involved. You heard, I spent a year as president of the World Medical Association. And I started by saying, what good does it do to treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick? And I said that I had two messages for the year in a world of post-fact politics. Evidence-based policy presented in a spirit of social justice. On the cover of the report of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, the commission that I chaired, we said 
Social injustice is killing on a grand scale. I'm currently chairing a commission on equity and health inequalities in the Americas set up by the Pan American Health Organization. And we were having a meeting in Washington, DC. I went for a walk in the mall. And I found myself in the area devoted to Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King said, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love. And I thought, unarmed truth, evidence-based policy. Yeah, um, he said it better than I did. But, and unconditional love, spirit of social justice, that'll do. So Dr. King said, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. That is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. And I think we have to believe that. We are in a dark time politically, in this country, in the US, Poland, Hungary, Marine Le Pen, AFD in Germany, lots of bad stuff going. But right temporarily defeated is stronger than evil triumphant. As it turned out, last year I was invited by the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Commission. They, they wouldn't like me to say this, but the Australian version of the BBC <laughs> to give a series of lectures, which I did, radio lectures. And when I arrived in Australia, they are very concerned about the poor health of Australian Aboriginals. The life expectancy gap, Indigenous Australians, Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders, 10.6 years for men, 9.4 years for women. And when I arrived to get off the plane, the journalist says, we spent billions of dollars trying to close this gap. What should we be doing? I said, I just arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Give me till tomorrow. <laughs> well, the Australian medical, one of the advantages of my role at the World Medical Association, the Australian Medical Association wrote to me and said, can we help you while you're here? And I said, yeah. I'd like to see doctors in action on social determinants of health. So they took me to a place called Campbelltown. Actually, its Aboriginal name is Sarawal, but a colonist called it Campbelltown. An Aboriginal community centre. I was shown around by two Aboriginal women who were administrators in the centre. They had doctors there, GPs, registrars, students, specialists. The belly cast program. They had pregnant women take plaster casts of their pregnant torsos and then decorate them with Aboriginal art because Aboriginal women don't turn up to antenatal care. So they got this program and the women love it. They come, well, of course they love it. Look how gorgeous it is. Um, it's absolutely gorgeous. And so the women come and then they come after pregnancy as well with the babies. Legal services, housing department, link to social services, disability support. I was there when the younger children were just being put down for their afternoon nap. And I spoke to the young woman looking after them and said, how do you know if these children are developing well? And she took a stack of forms off the shelf, one for each child, 30 indicators. Wow. So where did you get this? She said, from the university. All the things that I talk about, social, emotional, cognitive, linguistic, behavioural development, she's got it all down there, and physical development. The older kids playing, the deadly homework club. Um, every family attends one of these. These are well-evaluated programmes to improve parenting and child outcomes.
it's a campus with various centers and I went to the alcohol and drug place and I said to a large Aboriginal woman who was running it, I said, you must have the most difficult job in this whole place. She said, no, I have the most rewarding job. And she took me and showed me an Aboriginal painting on the wall. And she said, look at this. The man who did this, when he came here, he had problems of drugs and alcohol and domestic abuse. And we helped him put his life back together. And he did this painting and brought it back as a gift. I have the most rewarding job in the centre, she said. Good tucker all around. They have subsidised fruit and vegetables and programs for older people. I don't know if you can see that. Grannies against removal. <laughs> I talked to a child psychologist at the centre who was dealing with the consequences for children, psychological consequences for children and their families of removing children from the families. And I said, are you talking about the stolen generation? As you may know, in Australia there was a vogue for removing Aboriginal children from their families and trying to breathe the Aboriginal out of them, bring them up white, with disastrous consequences for the children and for the families. And she said, it's still going on because of drugs and alcohol and domestic abuse, so children are being removed. And then she said something to me, which I then repeated back to the journalist. I said, I do have an answer to your question. We've spent billions, but it hasn't solved the problem of the life expectancy gap. If for 200 years you systematically deprive people of their dignity, of their self-esteem, disempower them, it's hardly surprising that your billions don't solve the problem. The money is necessary to spend on programs, but you need to deal with the fundamental problem of disempowerment. <coughs> There's one member of the audience who will know what I'm going to say next. Um, as part of the trailing um, my lectures, the ABC, uh, they would not like me to say this, that we have, BBC has question time, the ABC has Q&A, but it looks like <laughs> question time. So the ABC version of question time, I was... I was on it to trail the lectures, and the Dimbleby person, with an Aussie accent, said, um, <coughs> ask me something about income distribution. And I said, which was in my lecture, what are the 48 million people who make up the population of Tanzania have in common with the 7 million people who make up the population of Paraguay and the 2 million people who make up the population of Latvia and the top earning 25 hedge fund managers in New York? And the answer is, last year, each of those groups had an income somewhere in the $23 billion to $28 billion range. So the top 25 earning hedge fund managers, $25 billion, a billion dollar each, were earning as much as the 48 million people of Tanzania. And then I said, suppose <coughs> that the hedge fund managers gave up their money for one year. They wouldn't miss it. <coughs> You're going to have a billion dollars each the next year. You could double the per capita income of Tanzania. And if you said, we're not going to give it to Tanzania, and think of the clean water you could pipe to the villages, the smokeless cook stoves you could provide, the schools, the nurses, and unlikely as it may seem, just suppose that the hedge fund managers said, we couldn't care less about Tanzanians. Well, here's a, an even more fanciful thought experiment, <coughs> particularly fanciful given the Paradise Papers, but suppose they paid a third of their income in tax, those hedge funds. <laughs> I know that's a completely outlandish idea. That would be enough money to employ 90,000 New York school teachers. 
and another panelist on the program said, you're in fantasy land, mate. <laughs> That's never going to happen. You're in fantasy land. Well, I didn't respond very well at the time, you know, that wit of the staircase. Um, but the next day, when I went to the Tharawal Community Centre, one of the doctors had a sign. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my lectures had been pre-recorded, but I was giving the first one before a live audience, and I asked the ABC, could I change the text of my first lecture? They said, well, okay, but don't stumble. Um, so, I said, in my, this lecture, just finished, I laid out inequalities in health within and between countries. And in the lectures that follow, I'm going to say what we can do about it. But let me anticipate by saying it will take a fairer distribution of power, money, and resources. But I've been told I'm in fantasy land. Imagine, I said, when Martin Luther King rose in Washington and made his most famous speech and said, I have a dream that on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will sit down together at the table of brotherhood. Instead, he said, I've been told I'm in fantasy <laughs> and we have to accept the status quo. There would have been no Civil Rights Act. So I say, come join me in my fantasy land and let's dream of a fairer world.